Um, welcome, everybody. I see we have 32 participants in so far and two people sitting in the waiting room. Hopefully they'll be let in soon. Um, the session today is entitled Scalability and Performance Tuning, and we only have an hour, so we, we, we're going to touch quite briefly on, on very few issues, I guess, in, in what's really a very broad topic. Uh, I'm fortunate today to be joined by Gintari and Daniel and Jason and Dan. Um, I'll explain a little bit what they're going to present in the next slide. Um, <coughs> so I've just got a, a couple of introductory slides framing a few problems. Um, Gintari is going to show us a little bit about some of the work that's been done back at base at the University of Oslo around performance testing. This is work that's been inspired, I guess, by the huge challenge that was faced with moving into um, the COVID-19 response, particularly vaccination campaigns where numbers got really, really big. Um, lots of interesting developments there in terms of how we have started to be able to test more more realistically, more repeatably, um, and the like. Daniel, Daniel, um, who's actually joined recently part-time assisting me <laughs> with, with sort of country service support. Um, Daniel's working with a company called Solid Lines. He's got really great experience working with very large databases with PSI and the like. Um, he's done in the last, month or so, a bit of a comparison around using Postgres 13 and Postgres 10, some of the results of which are kind of surprising, but interesting, I think, for, for people who care about their databases. Um, Jason, who I go back some years now, Jason Phillips from HISP South Africa. Um, again, long and battered experience working with HISP South Africa, managing quite a number of, of quite large DHS2 instances. Um, and then we're going to leave a bit of space, I hope, at the end towards open discussion. I know there's lots of lots of questions and, and interest around this topic, and we're fortunate to be joined by Dan Kokos as well from BAO, who will ask lots of difficult questions too as well. <laughs> so I don't want to take up too much time. I want to leave time for everybody else. But some of the challenges, as I see it, um, is I think probably the biggest challenge is that the DHS2 is deployed in so many different ways, right? So uh, there are people running from in the basement, as we say, to in the cloud. I mean, there are some places where, where um, there's a server sitting somewhere in a room in some ministry and the DHS2 is deployed on it and somehow or other they've got it onto the internet. And there are lots of particular challenges around managing a setup like that. Increasingly, we, we see more and more within countries that there's a government national data center which provides the enterprise service across ministries. Um, and DHS2 is deployed somewhere within that. Very common model is using cloud VPS systems. Linode historically been very strong, still very widely used. We've got good connections with Linode. AWS used for, by great numbers of people. Uh, that should be Contabo, not Conabo. <laughs> uh, Contabo is, is, is a more recent player. It's proved to be very, very attractive. Um, uh, largely because of cost, very, very good value. Um, cloud VPS solution. Daddy server has been used in a couple of countries as well. Um, through to the whole software as a service model, which I think the likes of BAO, and Blue Square, HISP South Africa, I guess, to a certain extent, um, of offering software as a service type offerings. And there's advantages and disadvantages and different kinds of challenges uh, involved in all of that spectrum. The other challenge I guess we find is that there are very, very different levels of skill and experience of the, 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 the poor people who end up uh, with the responsibility of, of having to host their DHS2 systems and often scale them to places where they haven't been before. Transitioning yeah, from managing quite small to large aggregate instances, which has been the kind of skill set that people have built up over the last 10, 15 years or so, to suddenly 
um, moving to managing very large tracker implementations and and where we've seen this really kind of bursting the through the ceilings is is on the vaccination campaigns um been looking in at, at nigeria for example the last the last few days i mean then 250 million Nigerians, and if you're going to vaccinate a, a reasonable proportion of that and, and track them all in tracker, we start talking about very, very large systems. Um, DHS2 software, as those of us who've been in the breach trying to, manage, trying to manage it will realize, is sometimes a very unruly donkey. Um, it doesn't always do behave quite the way we expect it to do. Um, the rapid increase in scale that we see often exposes what were, I guess, previously undiscovered performance issues. Um, and so managing a system like HS2 is not just routine monitoring, there's a lot of troubleshooting involved as well, um, particularly as, as we start stretching the boundaries of things. Um, sample of the couple of kind of issues which which um I, I mean, it's probably fairly random there there are many others traditionally uh, analytics generation time has been the big performance thing right people managing big aggregate databases and they start the the analytics job at midnight and hope that it'll be finished by five in the morning before the users start getting in um that's still a challenge in a number of places. There are still very large aggregate instances. Um, uh, for people who don't realize it, skipping zeros in analytics tables has been a really major breakthrough in, in improving the time that takes to get through. Uh, the problem of zeros in databases, I think, could be the topic of a whole um, discussion on its own. We don't have time to get into it now. The other thing that we, we find, and you find this because we're monitoring, um, there's Often you'll find that different API calls, IP, API calls cause different types of distress. And the, the kind of distress that we saw a lot the last two, three years is very, very high Tomcat CPU usage associated with, with um, particular API calls. And one of the learnings that we found from that is the kind of general rule of thumb, if you like, when you see really, really high CPU usage, Usually the solution to that isn't to add more CPU. The reason the CPU usage is high is because the system is struggling with memory. And um, we've had a few quite inefficient API calls which use gigabytes of memory. Um, and I think we've done quite a lot over the last year in particular to hammer a lot of those on the head. And again, a lot of credit going to Gintari and her testing environment for, for identifying uh, and dealing with some of those. The other thing, we find expensive backend database queries um, usually related to analytics. Some of these are really quite difficult to deal with. Um, and yeah, lots of diagnostic skills and, and hunches and things required. Recent problem that's been rearing its head for me at least, certainly the last six months to a year has been this issue of database connections being made outside of the database of the connection pool. In DHS2, we have this, this connection pool, which is used for probably 90% of all the queries, but there are a few places in the code where we make connections outside of that pool. And we've seen cases where those connections start to get out of control and reach the, reach the maximum connection count on the database and bring the system down. It's a, the kind of issues that sort of come up on a, on, a, on a frequent basis. I mean, there are probably more, but these are the ones that were in my head at the time of making this slide. Um, as I said at the start, I mean, managing DHS2 is a mixture really of, of the sort of routine monitoring and then frequently quite a lot of detailed troubleshooting. The different tools people use um, for the real basic stuff, things like Moonin and Monit. And I always install Moonin just by default, not because it's beautiful, it's actually quite ugly, um, but with very little configuration, I get most of the, the useful information that's required on a routine basis. I think there's a bit of competition at the moment. 
between the Prometheus Grafana combination and the Elk Stack combination. I mean, those are both two much more beautiful platforms, in some ways, much more flexible. Um, and I know they are both Prometheus and Elk users in, in our little panel today. So we might get a bit of discussion around that. Uh, profiling, particularly for troubleshooting, is, is really important. Um, your kit is something that's favored by developers, really detailed stuff. I found Glowroot, thanks to Dan for this, Dan in, in, in introduced me to Glowroot last year. Um, I found it totally invaluable for fixing all kinds of, of issues over the past year. It's worth pointing out maybe that knowing what to look for is much more important than having pretty tools. Um, I've seen lots of places where they have very beautiful tools, but they have no idea what the data means. Um, besides monitoring, alerting is really critical. And to be honest, I think it's very often a weak spot in a lot of our implementations. Um, I mean, generally, it's quite easy to set up things like email alerts, but a lot of implementations find it quite tricky because of all the, 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 the DNS setup that's involved with having a reliable email alerting system in today's world. Um, yeah, so we co-presenters today are the Gintari, Daniel and Jason. I'm gonna give them spot. Uh, we didn't discuss in advance the sequence to go in. Um, perhaps we'll just go in the sequence that we have here, um, starting with Gintari, who's gonna tell us a bit about the performance testing that we're doing um, back in Oslo. Daniel, as I say, is gonna give us just very brief overview of some of the the analysis he's been doing recently on Postgres uh, and Jason's going to tell us a little bit about what they've been doing down in down in Cape Town on the, the monitoring front. Um, what I hope to go to at, after that is is a, a bit of more open discussion and questions. I've got a couple of discussion questions here which um, we might get to. Um, the big one for me is how do we balance sort of very complex DevOps inv type environment with a kind of limited um, human resources, people who are just learning how to administer systems, who are, who, are, who are maybe taking on these challenges for the first time. Things like Kubernetes, things like load sharing with Tomcat and Postgres. I mean, I will say that in almost every case I've seen, people starting off trying to build configurations with, with, with load sharing, they almost all have failed and performed much worse than if they had done it more simply to start with. Um, there's, there's a lot of understanding that's required to, to put more complex configurations into place. I, a lot of learning we still need to do around that about how to be able to package those things. I mean, if, if, if we're really gonna recommend um, more and more sophisticated deployments, then how can we package them to make it easier for people to use? But I know those are just some sample questions from me. Um, the discussion may well develop differently, but what I wanna do now is to give over to Guntari and let's Thank you. Forward. Could you guys confirm that you see my presentation? Yes, like. Terry, we can see your slides. Perfect. Uh, I would like to stop sharing my video because I do want to show you guys performance testing. I know it's just me, Gidon. I can't hear you. Really? Uh, I, can hear, I can hear you, Jantara. Okay. Uh, does everyone else hear me? No, I got scared. Okay, I assume you guys do. So yes, I'm gonna stop my video because I'm gonna be showing you performance tests in action later. So we have been doing performance tests for around two years now, uh, and we are testing the releases. Uh, but this year has been special because of COVID pandemic, of course, it actually made us to uh, encourage us, I would say, to do some more extensive performance testing. We wanted to make sure that DHS2 can reliably support mass vaccination campaigns, that the packages, metadata packages we deliver 
support large scale of data. And we wanted to be proactive and find issues as soon as possible, instead of you guys coming up to coming to us with issues. And yeah, we were aiming to give you some recommendations for your implementations. But later on that. Uh, so steps we took. First, we started with the database. We did not have any large scale databases that we could use for this initiative. So we had to basically start from scratch. We generated a lot of org units and users, around 400,000 org units and users. Uh, but gradually, we actually scaled down on that. We imported four metadata packages. Uh, first of all, of course, it was COVID vaccination package. And then we also used COVID case-based surveillance, COVID events, and EPI packages, just to be able to you know, cover different scenarios. And then we generated data. So in the end, we end up with ended up with 3 million tracked entity instances, more than 6 million enrollments, 8 million events, and a lot, of, not a lot of data values and tracked entity attribute values. Then we got ourselves a quite powerful server. It had 32 cores and 128 gigabytes of random access memory. But we click, quickly saw that this wasn't showing us issues as fast as we wanted to. So we scaled on, on that as well. We got another server or AWS instance that was uh, that had only eight CPUs and 32 gigabytes of RAM. I'm sorry, I'm hearing some background noise. Can you guys mute? Uh, then we came up with the workflows that we thought would be the most common in the vaccination campaigns. It, it included all areas of DHS2, so Android, analytics, tracker, aggregate, everything. And we implemented tests for that, where it was missing. I'm going to show you the test tool we're using. We're using a tool called Locust IO as a test load generation tool. It is an open source tool uh, that is written in Python, but we do use Java integration. So right now I'm running uh, the tests and I have very low load just to be able to show you guys how it looks and what kind of information we're getting from it. Uh, so here, Martin, did you raise a hand? Uh, is it possible to zoom in a little bit on the, yes. on the figures? Thank you. Yes, I can. So the figures, is that enough? Yes, thank you. Great. So this is how the uh, tools dashboard looks. It gives us information about the endpoints we're testing, the response breakdown, which one of them are the slowest, which one of them are the fastest. It also gives us some nice charts that uh, shows how much response times depend on user count and similar. But this information is usually not enough. It is enough you know, when you, we want to compare the releases in terms of performance. But when we want to find issues, we actually have to monitor the test run better. So Bob uh, suggested us to use this tool called GlowRoots. Now I know that it wasn't his recommendation, but we're loving the tool and it's very helpful, it allows us to find a lot of issues. I'm not going to talk about the tool itself a lot because I know that we will have a presenter speaking about monitoring. So the tests, I want to quickly go back to the tests and tell you guys that we write tests in a way that they can be runnable against any implementation, or we try to. So the test generates data and API calls based on the metadata you have in your database. So if you would be interested to collaborate with us on that, you can just uh, drop me an email and we can make it work. We can benchmark your databases and instances. Okay, back to the presentation. 
So with this framework and performance tests, we were able to make a lot of impressive bug fixes and increase performance by a lot. Uh, so what we found was actually what Bob talked about earlier. It, we, it was slow database queries. It was uh, high CPU load on the Tomcat and similar. Also, we found some our own apps making very excessive calls like uh, skipping paging or requesting all fields when they didn't need them. Uh, so this is the chart that you might have seen on Monday. Marcos actually presented that on what's new on the HS2 session. And it just shows the performance improvements that we've made on Tracker. As you can see, the improvements are very impressive and especially what's related to Android. We were able to speed up sync by a lot. There's also some findings that we have not fixed yet. And that was um, because it needs quite a bigger effort, I'd say. So that's related to general tracker CPU usage and tracker being very heavy on the server. We want to improve that. And also analytics. We saw that uh, analytics is not very fast when it comes to large volumes of tracker data. So we're gonna be working on that soon, hope so. Yes, and recommendations. So I already mentioned that monitoring is very important. You should definitely get that. And also one thing that I'd like to recommend is to not be scared of upgrading the solution to use out. You use that support DHS2. So Java, for example, we did find that Java 11 works best with DHS2. So this is our official recommendation. Uh, yes. So that's all I wanted to share with you guys. Uh, in case you want to contribute to our performance test, please visit the, this repository on GitHub. And if you want to collaborate on performance testing your instance, just let me know. That's great, Kintari. I think very, very informative and interesting. And and yeah, I hope people do take you up on your invitation there. That um, we could we could Definitely. help by using our test environment and 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 country implementation can actually deploy it themselves and test against mm -hmm. their own their own test databases or staging instances. So very yeah. good. Thanks. Absolutely. Thanks very much. Um, Thank you for inviting. Who do we have up next, Daniel? Now, Daniel, I know you've got a lot of facts and figures there, so we have to squeeze you into 10 minutes. So <laughs> good luck with that. I'm going, I'm going to, go to, to go quickly through, through the slides of the results. OK, let me share my screen. Um, here. Yeah. Can you see my, my screen? No. Uh, no. no. Uh, let me. There we go. Yep. Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about the performance between PostgreSQL 10 and PostgreSQL 13. And for this, uh, we have run several tests uh, with uh, four different servers. Uh, with the DHIS2-233.6 uh, and the others with uh, 236 and uh, each of the servers with different Postgres, Postgres version. Okay, uh, well, the tests were about the database sizing, uh, some of them about the analytic tables update, uh, some Low testing about the track identity instances, uh, about the upload and download the TIs, because this caused a high load in the in the system. And finally, uh, well, some execution plans about the some sample queries, 
and uh, some conclusions about the about the test. Okay, uh, well, these these are the specifications of the servers. We have used um, uh, AWS instances with the CPUs, uh, sixty-four gigas of RAM, and all with the same operating system, uh, the web server, Tomcat, and the different PostgreSQL versions. The database uh, we have used uh, was the was the same for all the for the servers. It was a production database, uh, large enough to to draw conclusions. We have uh, more than sixty five thousand data elements, a lot of programs or units, TIs, events, etc. Okay, uh, the first test were, were about the DB sizing. And as we can see, uh, one of the main advantages uh, about the using PostgreSQL 13 is the, the size of the of the database. Uh, it's up to 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 42 percent uh, smaller with uh, with uh, full analytics. And the difference as we can see is, is higher if if the the years of the analytics are are increased, okay. Uh, well, uh, the 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 next test were about the uh, analytic tables update the generation and, and well the performance uh, with PostgreSQL thirteen is a bit lower uh, about the. 10% more or less. Uh, well, these these are the, the results of the of the test uh, about the resource tables update and about the analytics table tables update. Um, the timing is similar uh, between 2:33 and 2:36, uh, although it's better with with 2:30 36. But uh, it's better also with PostgreSQL 10. Uh, as I said, uh, about the 10% lower. And if we go to the other uh, toilet uh, timing, uh, we will see that the, that the main bottleneck uh, about the analytic tables update is when the analytic tables uh, are being populated. Okay. As we can see, um, when with this with this task with this task, uh, the, the, when when the analytic tables are are being populated, for example, for for the events, it takes uh, about a one hour more. So well, it's not it's not very good. Okay, uh, the, the next, next test uh, uh, that we, we ran uh, were about the, the load testing, about the upload and, and download the TIs with a different number of concurrent users to, to increase the, the load in the, in the system and then uh, to get the, 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 the average uh, response times. And as we can see, the performance is much, much better with the latest uh, release of DHAS2. Uh, and of course, uh, the improvement is about the 20% better with PostgreSQL 13. Okay. And more or less the same with with the with the post test about the track identity instances is much better with with uh, 236 and postgresql 13 okay and uh, finally uh, we have run uh, some tests about the execution plans of some of some sample queries, okay. 
eh, eh, the, the, the performance is, is, is um, better with Postgres uh, 13. But not uh, with the with the with the analytic uh, queries, okay, as as it was expected. And for for the other kind of of queries, the, the performance is, is better with with uh, PostgreSQL 13. And the 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 gain with uh, Queries about the track identity instances, so for example, with uh, relationship item, is much, much, much better with 2.36, and of course, with uh, PostgreSQL 13. And finally, as a conclusion, uh, well, we can say that the uh, upgrade to PostgreSQL 13 is, is recommended. And of course, the, the latest uh, releases of DHAS2. Because as we can, as we can see, the, 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 the database sizing is uh, up to 42 smaller with full analytics and PostgreSQL 13. And uh, well, the, although the, the analytic tables update, Uh, takes about the uh, 10% more, more or less, with PostgreSQL 13. The overall performance improvement uh, outweighs the, the loss of, of that uh, efficiency with, with the analytic generation. Uh, well, the, the, the global behavior is, is better with PostgreSQL 13, and of course, with 2.36. Um, well, Thanks, Dan. I mean, everything. that is a really interesting bit of analytical work that you, you, you've done there. Um, I'm a little bit relieved because I've been recommending people to go to 13 for some time. <laughs> And mm. I was worried that you were going to come up with the wrong conclusions. I'm kind of surprised that the analytics generation takes longer, but um, um, it is what it is. Uh, yeah, the disk we... the disk space saving is hugely significant. I think for a lot of people, where disks are actually quite expensive part of their their plan often. Um, but maybe we'll we'll hear from Jason and maybe from Dan. I don't know where they are currently in their thinking on database versions. But um, let's move on to Jason's presentation and then hopefully we come back to this question. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Interesting, you should say that, Bob. Funnily enough, um, drive space is one of the one of the issues we don't really um, worry too much about in South Africa. It's it's one of the things we have an, an overabundance of. Um, uh, but I suspect that's that's specific to our um, our leased environment. <clears throat> All right. Um, Uh, good day, everyone, and welcome. Um, uh, thanks for attending, and Bob, thanks for inviting me to talk to you today. Um, also, thanks to René Rousseau, uh, an infrastructure colleague who helped put um, this short presentation together with me. And uh, apologies again uh, on behalf of Potlaki Malloy, um, the current infrastructure manager for HISP South Africa, who was unable to attend today. Uh, that leaves you stuck with me. So uh, let me introduce myself. I, I'm the ex-infrastructure manager for HISP South Africa um, and uh, been with HISP for um, since 2013, so nearly a decade now. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about the importance of performance monitoring in larger scale um, DHIS deployments. I say larger. Um, <clears throat> we, um, we have a reasonably complex environment, I would guess, you know, by comparison to the, um, the average um, NGO or, or NPO type environment, certainly, but 
Um, I'm well aware that in a in a corporate scale, um, uh, we're we're definitely small potatoes. But in our peak um, in 2018, we had around um, 400 servers. Um, we're now at about 250 through some efficiencies and, and change in our design. Um, and that's mixed um, what we call the Bob model, which is a, um, uh, a mix of um, bare metal and, and virtualization in our environment. Um, uh, at the time we were hosting around, around 220 instances of DHIS2, <clears throat> hosted across 54 physical um, Intel Xeon E5s uh, and our, our total environment uh, had around four terabytes of RAM. Um, in amongst that lot, not only was DHIS2, but uh, other applications as well, but we were hosting about 80 uh, unique DHIS2 databases. Uh, and those were from multiple countries. And um, as I'm sure you surmised, they were mixed. Uh, originally in the early years, certainly back 2013, 2014, 2015, most of our databases were, were routine or aggregate databases. Um, but over the years, as Bob mentioned, um, the, the focus on tracker and event um, has increased. And so uh, today, in fact, our, our tracker databases outnumber our, our aggregate routine um, systems. So the, the HISP South Africa um, infrastructure team can, uh, has oscillated between about two to seven people over the years. Um, but we are supported by a large uh, data science and data management team <clears throat> of um, uh, over the years varied between 12 and, and 25 odd um, individuals. So I'm sure you've all heard great stories throughout um, the, uh, the conference of, of excellent work and success. Um, and today I'm going to tell you a slightly different story. Uh, it's one of trial, tribulation, uh, tantrums and trepidation. Um, and I share the story with you all in the hopes that you'll learn as we did from our errors and work towards ensuring they don't become mistakes. Any error is a good learning opportunity. Um, and to paraphrase Robert Kiyosaki, the best way to predict the future is to study the past. So let me start by saying, uh, it's my experience that there is no normal. Um, as, as Bob and, and the other speakers have mentioned today, uh, there, there is a wildly different um, uh, performance and behavior animal built into two different versions of, of DHIS, such as a, a routine aggregated national instance um, and compared that to a for example, a, a tracker-based um, uh, instance that is, you know, receiving data from mobile devices in the field via the API. Um, likewise, um, over the years, depending on the version of DHIS that you've used or the specific configuration, the, the type of database that you use, the type of usage that it will um, experience, the whether the traffic is, uh, is more aggregated or whether it is... Um, you know, highly transactional, you've got um, factors such as the resource allocation uh, variation between the web server and the database server, which will have a massive difference on, on um, not only your system's performance, but um, the is dictated to some extent by the type of system that you have. And obviously there is a, a vast difference between um, a an instance uh, serving uh, a population of 5 million versus uh, a population of 55 million. Uh, and over the years, the hardware has changed significantly as well. Um, if you compare the, the CPU mark of a 2002 era E5 Xeon with a modern day <clears throat> AMD Epic 7700 series processor, they are just worlds apart. Um, you can you can condense an entire data center of E5 Xeons into, into one or two Apex, um, you know, 30 or 40 machines and get comparable performance, albeit potentially with some 
um, some troublesome bottlenecks here and there, but um, pure, purely talking CPU power. And then, of course, the other thing to consider is your your connectivity. What uh, you know, uh, what is in in place for your particular project, uh, and that will that will definitely affect your your system performance. Um, doesn't matter how fancy your server is or how slow the server is, if the people connecting to it are doing so through uh, the equivalent of a of a straw. Um, using edge or, or some uh, intermittent or poor connection type. So this, this uh, absence of there being a normal, in my opinion, means that there, there is, there's no shortage of, of um, uh, ways to, to correctly monitor and, and, um, and track your system performance. Um, there's definitely no shortage of wrong ways to do it either, um, but there are lots of ways to do it correct, uh, and, and they won't all be the same, uh, and sometimes will be inappropriate for certain circumstances, but utterly appropriate for others. So my, my story of woe it, it begins a few years ago, um, <clears throat> and uh, it was a, uh, a national uh, mobile-based tracker capture program. Um, some sometime uh, yeah, five or six years ago, <clears throat> um, and uh, it had an initial deployment um, with a couple of hundred devices to be scaled up uh, to a national uh, scenario. Uh, each device would then be in the hands of a, a mobile healthcare worker, capturing hundreds of records, which would then sync up daily. Um, the program's timeline from concept to launch was extremely aggressive. Uh, Lucy, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Just a brief warning. You've got about two minutes. Sure. Um, was extremely aggressive. It was to last several months, but uh, kicked off just a couple of weeks after it was conceived. So this rapid deployment meant that we didn't have a baseline. We didn't do enough testing. Um, we couldn't use Hibernate caching and database replication and um, because at the time we didn't know how to. Uh, and so we were ill prepared um, for, for what happened next. We had um, no performance monitoring capability at the time. We were using a, a company called uh, Monitor.us to do all our performance monitoring. And they had just uh, a couple of months before decided to switch over to a paid model. Um, and and the, the cost implications of monitoring such a large um, infrastructure was uh, were, were just prohibitive, so we couldn't do that. The result, because uh, Bob spoke earlier about the, the behavior of the API under certain circumstances, back then it was worse, it's a lot better now. Um, and because of the, the short timelines that the, the project uh, was operating under, and because we had no way to, to monitor um, properly what was happening on our systems, uh, we were caught unawares when, when um, we began to experience um, uh, considerable performance issues. Degradation in performance, and then eventually repeated Tomcat death. So we had um, multiple systems load balanced to try and, and solve the problem through hardware at the issue, which is, I think everyone will recall at the beginning of, of uh, the session, Bob said that is not the answer. He's quite right. Uh, and uh, we had to learn that the hard way um, because we just did not have sufficient data to, to identify the problem and respond to it um, in the most appropriate manner. So we had a lot of people um, spending a lot of time uh, propping up Tomcat instances uh, after they'd fallen over. Uh, and the result was, was um, a significant cost increase for us in terms of our um, uh, what that project cost us. It didn't need to, but it, it wound up costing us a lot more than it should. One minute. So, hmm? One minute. I won't be much longer. So... Um, that's where my message of understanding the problem is key. Um, and some advice 
um, what we've learned from that experience. Um, what is your normal? Achieve your baseline. Um, look at a combination of both long-term or medium-term uh, and live telemetry. Uh, so uh, we use ELK and, and net data, but there are lots of really good tools out there to do that. Um, use the past to plan for the future, understand your system, spend the time required to, to do the testing in advance, um, and, and make sure that a, a good monitoring system is in place, which will decrease your response and investigation time significantly, which in turn reduces your overhead. Um, do stress testing, load testing. Um, we're excited to, to speak more to um, Gitarre and experiment with uh, the various configuration possibilities. And the six Ps, proper planning and preparation prevents poor performance. And we've since had some success uh, in the ICSP program. There are speakers who have given presentation on this far better than I can. Um, yeah, thanks, Jason. Jason, I, I think we're gonna have to leave you on a high note here of, sure. of success. <laughs> I'm glad you we, we ended with the success slide. I don't think they were helpful. Journey has been hard. Uh, we've only got a few minutes left. I wonder, Dan, could we ask you maybe to respond to what you've seen or even just to add something from your own experience at BAO over the years, which might be useful to, to others to hear? Um, yeah, I guess the... After seeing that presentation, I know I'm going to get a lot of requests to upgrade to PG-13. Um, I, I think the problem with that is that sometimes it'll help you, sometimes it won't. Um, the, the tracker improvements, I think, will be incredibly helpful. One of the things that we've been working on with monitoring is we're using a tool, of course, it's commercial, but it will work pretty well called Datadog. And what that allows us to do is it's built more for the model like Netflix, where you don't have individual instances doing one thing, <clears throat> which is kind of the glow root model. What I can do is look at RAM usage across all 200 servers and see what's going on there. And so that's one of the tools that we've been kind of digging into to help find where the bottlenecks are, depending on versions is one of the things that we've kind of run into. Yeah, that's interesting. Oh, Datadog, I know, is very, very, very nice. I, I learn a lot from looking at the Datadog documentation pages. Um, I've not had the pleasure of working with the tool. There's quite a bit going on in the chat. I wonder, does anybody want to, to ask any particular question to anyone who's presented? So this is the point where people tend to go quiet. Otherwise, Dan, can I ask you something? Um, particularly around, around load balancing. I think you guys have got more experience with doing load balancing than, than anybody else. I've seen lots of examples, as I said at the start, of people attempting to do it following the documentation, but not really understanding what they're doing. And as a consequence, making performance far worse than better. Um, I don't know what your experience has been. I know a little bit. Um, I'm particularly interested around, around replication of the database, for example, and difficulties with that, with analytics. Any yeah, pointers, so, advice? Yeah, so the, we with the horizontal scaling, um, we did a bunch of testing. Uh, the, first, the first project we did it on was with Datum. So we had the resources in a pretty huge database to work with. And what we found is Somewhere between, once you hit six nodes, the overhead for everything else kind of makes it a, a moot point. And so what we, we did, what we found is three to six nodes seems to be where you want to do the horizontal scaling. Um, the main bottleneck in that case is the database. And so you always want to have a, uh, you know, a replica that you can fail over. Database replication, as everyone knows, is incredibly difficult. And so for that, we actually leave it to Amazon and we use their RDS product because they have a they probably have more engineers than we have staff just working on that particular problem. Um, I will say the, the one thing and, and um, we've discussed it with Lars is there as it stands right now, there's not a good way to auto scale up and down because the DHIS2 comp has to know which instance talks to which instance.
is if there's any other questions about kind of the horizontal scaling. Oh, thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, I think that the Postgres replication is still the real vexing issue for many of us. Um, and as I say, a lot of the cases where people have tried it, it hasn't worked out too well for them. Um, it's really attractive, this idea of letting RDS take care of it. <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll give an example of, granted this was quite a long time ago, but the I worked at the travel company Orbitz and they had a team of probably 200 DBAs. And at one point I asked about, you know, do you do replication for databases to kind of take the load off? And he said, it's just easier to have a larger database, uh, a larger database server than it is to deal with replication. Jason, I think, I think that's your experience as well, is it? No, you guys were looking at, we were chatting with Blarky a number of times around replication. I don't know. Yeah, <clears throat> so we've, we've, uh, we do use it, um, but, but I, I agree with Dan, uh, our experience is probably uh, by and large, and uh, with the exception of for very specific circumstances, um, it would, it's more efficient to just use uh, more resources, uh, throw more, resources at the problem rather than um, using replication. I was going to say the, the other example use case that we've seen is where you have the production database doing all the data collection, and then you use the replicated database for re uh, reporting. But the analytics process is pretty intense. And initially, we found that it, the replicated database had to actually be larger than the original database just to be able to keep up with all the analytics logs mm -hmm. coming in. Yeah, I think what we're all looking forward to seeing is taking that whole analytics generation task off the, the domain data collection database completely. And I, I know that there is some movement in that direction. I know Lars is, is actively looking at the problem as well. Intari, in your performance tests, you haven't tested running against um, load balanced Tomcats or against a replicated database at, at, at present, have you? No, not yet. But this is a plan for, of course, going forward. And uh, we are definitely looking for any kind of recommendations that we can test. We are planning to test, of course, several setups and just see which one works best. So yeah, later. If I, I may have a question for Daniel. Um, when you did your PG uh, 13 versus 10 testing, how many years of analytics data were in your data set? Uh, we make tests uh, with, uh, for one year, two years, four years, and uh, I don't know how much years for the full analytics. I can't, I can't remember that. You're going to make him run a query live now, Dan. No, no. <laughs> it, was more, it was more along what I had mentioned in the chat is that we noticed basically you need to tie a CPU to the number of years. And we started getting to the point where, you know, most, most systems are four or eight CPUs. And so once somebody hit 10 years of data, we started running the bottlenecks and try to figure out what was going on. And uh, we basically found that it was a seat like, as analytics generates its tables, you need basically a CPU because it, it's each year basically gets a dedicated CPU for while it spins out the analytics. Mm -hmm. I saw that in the chat. It's actually quite, 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 quite an interesting little rule of thumb. Um, we, we need my, many more of these rules of thumb, I think, to try to at least take an initial stab on what kind of resource allocation to throw at what kind of what kind of shape of database. I think we've reached the top of the hour though. We're probably gonna be kicked out soon. So if we, just in case we are, let me just thank everybody who's presented and thank Dan for making time to be available as well. Um, it's been interesting for me 